Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer, A, B or C. Question one. You hear two friends talking about a TV series called Teenage Cooks. Did you see the final episode of Teenage Cooks? Yeah. I've never seen anything like those seafood dishes they made. Me neither. Apparently they're Malaysian specialities. It all looks really professional too, especially when you remember how terrible their food at the start of the series was. They were being trained by a top chef though. It can't be that hard to cook a few prawns with some rice. But those guys were only 13 years old. True. They made the most of their opportunities too. I don't know how they stayed so positive actually, you know. Always looking so cheerful. I'd hate to spend hours on end in a kitchen myself. Did you see the final episode of Teenage Cooks? Yeah. I've never seen anything like those seafood dishes they made. Me neither. Apparently they're Malaysian specialities. It all looks really professional too, especially when you remember how terrible their food at the start of the series was. They were being trained by a top chef though. It can't be that hard to cook a few prawns with some rice. But those guys were only 13 years old. True. They made the most of their opportunities too. I don't know how they stayed so positive actually, you know, always looking so cheerful. I'd hate to spend hours on end in a kitchen myself. Question two. You hear a girl talking about a school sports day when students compete against each other. Sports day last year was an afternoon off from normal lessons, watching the school's best athletes do their thing and try to win the prizes. It was great seeing all the teachers and students chill out after the stress of another hard term. I'm not particularly sporty, so I didn't have the chance to take part. I wasn't picked to run, which was no surprise and didn't really bother me. You were supposed to cheer for your team, but me and my friends didn't care that much who won and you didn't get the feeling that anyone was putting in much effort, which didn't go down too well with the teachers. Sports day last year was an afternoon off from normal lessons, watching the school's best athletes do their thing and try to win the prizes. It was great seeing all the teachers and students chill out after the stress of another hard term. I'm not particularly sporty, so I didn't have the chance to take part. I wasn't picked to run, which was no surprise and didn't really bother me. You were supposed to cheer for your team, but me and my friends didn't care that much who won, and you didn't get the feeling that anyone was putting in much effort, which didn't go down too well with the teachers. Question 3. You hear two friends talking about a film they have just watched. How did you find the film? I saw you covering your eyes in the scary bits. Yeah, there were times when I just couldn't look. I didn't miss much, though. That's good, because if you'd looked away for too long, you wouldn't have understood what was going on. I didn't think it was too frightening, but it was sometimes hard to follow. Well, we'd done that period in history at school, so I knew the background to it. You couldn't complain about the acting, especially those two kids. Hard to believe they're only 13. They certainly held their own with the adult stars. But I still wouldn't want to see it again. How did you find the film? I saw you covering your eyes in the scary bits. Yeah, there were times when I just couldn't look. I didn't miss much, though. That's good, because if you'd looked away for too long, you wouldn't have understood what was going on. I didn't think it was too frightening, but it was sometimes hard to follow. Well, we'd done that period in history at school, so I knew the background to it. You couldn't complain about the acting, especially those two kids. Hard to believe they're only 13. They certainly held their own with the adult stars. But I still wouldn't want to see it again. Question 4. 
You hear a teacher talking to her students about some stories they have written. I've now been through your stories. You all stuck to the basic plot I gave you. A girl moves to a new school where everything's strange and different from what she's used to, and we find out how she deals with it. You describe the challenges someone like that would face very well, and what you had the girl and other people saying to each other was particularly convincing. That's how people actually speak. I did feel you could have included more details about the personalities of certain people to help the reader imagine what they look like and how they behave. But on the whole, you did a great job. I've now been through your stories. You all stuck to the basic plot I gave you. A girl moves to a new school where everything's strange and different from what she's used to, and we find out how she deals with it. You describe the challenges someone like that would face very well, and what you had the girl and other people saying to each other was particularly convincing. That's how people actually speak. I did feel you could have included more details about the personalities of certain people to help the reader imagine what they look like and how they behave. But on the whole, you did a great job. Question five: You hear two friends. Talking about a man who gave a talk at their school. What did you think of our visiting speaker then? The way he got across some very difficult stuff was great, and the visuals he used were helpful. I thought. I know what you mean. Not sure I got my head round absolutely everything he said though. But I thought the last speaker we had was really rather boring, so I was surprised this one kept my attention for the full hour.、Mm, I didn't think he'd manage to keep me listening like that. He's coming again next term to do the subject in more detail, which will be good. I think that might have been quite enough detail for me, actually. What did you think of our visiting speaker then? The way he got across some very difficult stuff was great, and the visuals he used were helpful. I thought. I know what you mean. Not sure I got my head round absolutely everything he said, though. But I thought the last speaker we had was really rather boring, so I was surprised this one kept my attention for the full hour.、Mm, I didn't think he'd manage to keep me listening like that. He's coming again next term to do the subject in more detail, which will be good. I think that might have been quite enough detail for me, actually. Question six: You hear a girl talking about studying environmental studies as a school subject. I had to do a class on environmental studies last term. I really wanted to do more physics or chemistry, and I thought studying the environment didn't count as real science somehow. I'm happy to say it was more challenging than I expected, though, and I've changed my mind. It's helped me understand chemistry and biology better. It's given me the big picture, and it's made it easier for me to understand what's happening in the world. I've realised that every day I'm making decisions that can help or hurt the environment, like picking up litter or turning off the lights when you leave a room. I had to do a class on environmental studies last term. I really wanted to do more physics or chemistry, and I thought studying the environment didn't count as real science somehow. I'm happy to say it was more challenging than I expected, though, and I've changed my mind. It's helped me understand chemistry and biology better. It's given me the big picture, and it's made it easier for me to understand what's happening in the world. I've realised that every day I'm making decisions that can help or hurt the environment, like picking up litter or turning off the lights when you leave a room. Question seven: You hear two friends talking about attending an event called World Sleep Day. Did you enjoy World Sleep Day? Well, apart from those students who kept talking about how much sport they do, yeah, I did. I know what you mean. 
The day was meant to be about sleep, not doing loads of exercise to make you exhausted. But there was interesting information about how much sleep different people should get and how lack of it can affect you. Well, thinking about it, lots of that stuff's fairly obvious, though it's worth being reminded of it. Like, as teenagers, we need nine hours sleep a night to function well. Yeah, I'm going to go to bed an hour earlier from now on. Did you enjoy World Sleep Day? Well, apart from those students who kept talking about how much sport they do, yeah, I did. I know what you mean. The day was meant to be about sleep, not doing loads of exercise to make you exhausted. But there was interesting information about how much sleep different people should get and how lack of it can affect you. Well, thinking about it, lots of that stuff's fairly obvious, though it's worth being reminded of it. Like, as teenagers, we need nine hours sleep a night to function well. Yeah, I'm going to go to bed an hour earlier from now on. Question 8. You hear a man talking about forming a partnership with a friend to make music. I first heard Janie singing in an all-girl band at school and I was singing on my own at the time. Her voice really stood out for me. You just don't hear many singers like that. But I didn't realise until later how great she really is. Anyway, we were just good friends to begin with and we were earning a bit of money at weekends singing with different support bands, each of us trying to make it individually but without much success. But then it occurred to us that we should get together, just the two of us, and we haven't looked back. It works brilliantly. I first heard Janie singing in an all-girl band at school and I was singing on my own at the time. Her voice really stood out for me. You just don't hear many singers like that. But I didn't realise until later how great she really is. Anyway, we were just good friends to begin with and we were earning a bit of money at weekends singing with different support bands, each of us trying to make it individually but without much success. But then it occurred to us that we should get together, just the two of us, and we haven't looked back. It works brilliantly. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear an interview with a successful teenage businessman called Phil Sandwell, who is talking about setting up a business while continuing with his studies. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi, I'm Phil Sandwell, and I was just 12 years old when I started my first business. At that time, there were plenty of websites giving information about almost anything anyone wanted to know, but I set up a website where people could play games and not pay anything. There were virtually no websites doing that at the time. It was a really new thing back then. I charged £12 for each ad on the site, and that's how I made money. So, my first business, which I called Fun Factory, really took off and became well known. And at the age of 17, I got the opportunity to be on a radio show for teenagers called Wake Up. It featured current affairs and things of interest to young people. I had a 10-minute slot giving advice on starting your own business. Unfortunately, the programme was axed after about a year – but I've included lots of the advice I gave in a book I've just finished writing for young people interested in going into business. In the book, I give advice about how to get young people to buy stuff. 
I mean, if you want to sell things to other teenagers, you've got to know how and where to advertise. For example, teenagers look at lots of magazines but don't bother with newspapers so much, so there's no point advertising there. Actually, the cheapest thing to do is produce well-designed leaflets. Some people think that my book's based on what I've done in my life, but that wouldn't have been too successful because I don't have enough business experience yet. I did some research into what was important for wannabe teenage business people, and one thing that kept coming up was that finding time was their greatest concern rather than finding the money or ideas, which surprised me a bit. Of course, trying to get a book published isn't easy, but I had an editor who was willing to check my book for free, my mum, and the designer of the front cover was my dad. <laughs> Then I found a small publisher who thought the book would be a success and was willing to give it a try. I've had various write-ups in the press. Some people think what I do is boring, but others are more interested. One business mag recently said something that made me laugh. They called me a born leader. Anyway, that's better than being called a sad loser, as somebody in a chat show once described me, rather unkindly. But you can't always be successful. I mean, two years ago, I started a business with a partner selling software. We ran out of funds, and it looked as if it wasn't going to survive. But we produced a decent business plan, and my bank gave us a loan. We were successful for a while, but then we had to sell up because we were having too many disagreements. So at the moment I'm studying business at college, but I'm also a teaching assistant in an IT class at a local high school, which is great. And because it's only part time, I have no problem fitting it in with college work. A friend also offered me work as a business advisor in a small company he'd set up, but it would have been too much for me to take on. I don't know what I'll do in the future. I'd like to try something different, though, in the area of politics rather than finance or writing. I know I'm good at persuading people to do things, so who knows? It might be my sort of thing. What I've learned is that business people should have determination and lots of common sense. But having a good imagination—that's the one thing you just can't do without. You've also got to try to be flexible, of course, and be willing to take the rough with the smooth. Oh. And a sense of humour also helps. Now you'll hear part two again. Hi, I'm Phil Sandwell, and I was just twelve years old when I started my first business. At that time, there were plenty of websites giving information about almost anything anyone wanted to know. But I set up a website where people could play games and not pay anything. There were virtually no websites doing that at the time. It was a really new thing back then. I charged twelve pounds for each ad on the site, and that's how I made money. So my first business, which I called Fun Factory, really took off and became well known. And at the age of seventeen, I got the opportunity to be on a radio show for teenagers called Wake Up. It featured current affairs and things of interest to young people. I had a ten-minute slot giving advice on starting your own business. Unfortunately, the program was axed after about a year, but I've included lots of the advice I gave in a book I've just finished writing for young people interested in going into business. In the book, I give advice about how to get young people to buy stuff. I mean, if you want to sell things to other teenagers. You've got to know how and where to advertise. For example, teenagers look at lots of magazines, but don't bother with newspapers so much. So there's no point advertising there. Actually, the cheapest thing to do is produce well-designed leaflets. Some people think that my book's based on what I've done in my life, but that wouldn't have been too successful because I don't have enough business experience yet. I did some research into what was important for wannabe teenage business people, and one thing that kept coming up was that finding time was their greatest concern rather than finding the money or ideas, which surprised me a bit. Of course, trying to get a book published isn't easy, but I had an editor who was willing to check my book for free, my mum, and the designer of the front cover was my dad. <laughs> 
Then I found a small publisher who thought the book would be a success and was willing to give it a try. I've had various write-ups in the press. Some people think what I do is boring, but others are more interested. One business mag recently said something that made me laugh. They called me a born leader. Anyway, that's better than being called a sad loser, as somebody in a chat show once described me, rather unkindly. But you can't always be successful. I mean, two years ago, I started a business with a partner selling software. We ran out of funds, and it looked as if it wasn't going to survive. But we produced a decent business plan, and my bank gave us a loan. We were successful for a while, but then we had to sell up because we were having too many disagreements. So at the moment, I'm studying business at college, but I'm also a teaching assistant in an IT class at a local high school, which is great. And because it's only part time, I have no problem fitting it in with college work. A friend also offered me work as a business advisor in a small company he'd set up, but it would have been too much for me to take on. I don't know what I'll do in the future. I'd like to try something different, though, in the area of politics rather than finance or writing. I know I'm good at persuading people to do things, so who knows? It might be my sort of thing. What I've learnt is that business people should have determination and lots of common sense. But having a good imagination—that's the one thing you just can't do without. You've also got to try to be flexible, of course. And be willing to take the rough with the smooth. Oh, and a sense of humour also helps. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five short extracts in which teenagers. Are talking about doing an art project at school. For questions nineteen to twenty-three, choose from the list A to H how each speaker felt about the art project. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have thirty seconds to look at part three. Speaker one. Last term, my art teacher had us designing posters for school events. My group wanted to do the sports day poster, but our teacher decided another group should do it, so we designed the school play poster instead. The idea was that it should persuade people to go and see the play, and it seemed to have worked. Various people said they wouldn't have gone if they hadn't seen the poster. It's funny because. We had endless discussions about whether it should show characters from the play or be more abstract. We finally went for my idea, the abstract design, which upset some of the group, but they ended up admitting they'd been wrong. Speaker two. Our art teacher got us making face masks with a technique called papier mâché. We tore up newspapers and mixed them up with sticky paste. Then we made different shaped masks with the mixture, and when it had hardened, we decorated it. Me and my friends didn't know what to do at first, especially because our teacher didn't do a lot to help us. Once we got going, though, it was good fun. We even planned to make a whole set of masks, but then we thought we should concentrate on just one of them. It would have been nice to produce a few more. We had enough materials, but our teacher said we'd do something similar next term. Speaker three. The art project we did was to make sort of sculptures and other stuff using recycled materials. My group made two statues out of a couple of large plastic bottles, some old clothes, and various other things that we fixed onto the bottles. 
We had a great laugh doing it, and I was amazed that our teacher loved the sculptures so much. But some people in the class said things like, "That's not proper art." Comments like that get on my nerves. Maybe our figures weren't as good as they could have been, but they were okay, especially as we only had two lessons to do them in. Speaker four. My art teacher organised a class competition to design a logo for an imaginary company that makes sports clothes. Working in groups, we had to design the logo and present it to the class. Everyone in my group enjoys arguing. We're strong personalities, and it took us ages to agree on what our design should be. Going through the process, it became obvious how hard it must be for professionals to have ideas that are both original and effective. I hadn't realised that before. We thought the design we eventually came up with was pretty good, actually, but it didn't win, which was such a pity because we really wanted it to. Speaker five. Our teacher gave us a choice of projects. Me and two friends opted to paint a group portrait. We thought it'd be fun, but after a while, we realised we weren't getting anywhere. Our first sketches looked ridiculous, and other students in the class weren't exactly kind about them. So then our teacher gave us some advice about what to focus on. The final picture wasn't exactly what we'd hoped for, but it was an improvement on our early efforts, and a lot of that was down to her. To be honest, the portrait should have been good because all three of us are actually quite good at art. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. Last term, my art teacher had us designing posters for school events. My group wanted to do the sports day poster, but our teacher decided another group should do it, so we designed the school play poster instead. The idea was that it should persuade people to go and see the play, and it seemed to have worked. Various people said they wouldn't have gone if they hadn't seen the poster. It's funny because we had endless discussions about whether it should show characters from the play or be more abstract. We finally went for my idea, the abstract design, which upset some of the group, but they ended up admitting they'd been wrong. Speaker two. Our art teacher got us making face masks with a technique called papier mâché. We tore up newspapers and mixed them up with sticky paste. Then we made different shaped masks with the mixture, and when it had hardened, we decorated it. Me and my friends didn't know what to do at first, especially because our teacher didn't do a lot to help us. Once we got going, though, it was good fun. We even planned to make a whole set of masks, but then we thought we should concentrate on just one of them. It would have been nice to produce a few more. We had enough materials, but our teacher said we'd do something similar next term. Speaker three. The art project we did was to make sort of sculptures and other stuff using recycled materials. My group made two statues out of a couple of large plastic bottles, some old clothes, and various other things that we fixed onto the bottles. We had a great laugh doing it, and I was amazed that our teacher loved the sculptures so much. But some people in the class said things like, "That's not proper art." Comments like that get on my nerves. Maybe our figures weren't as good as they could have been, but they were okay, especially as we only had two lessons to do them in. Speaker four. My art teacher organised a class competition to design a logo for an imaginary company that makes sports clothes. Working in groups, we had to design the logo and present it to the class. Everyone in my group enjoys arguing. We're strong personalities, and it took us ages to agree on what our design should be. Going through the process, it became obvious how hard it must be for professionals to have ideas that are both original and effective. I hadn't realised that before. We thought the design we eventually came up with was pretty good, actually, but it didn't win, which was such a pity because we really wanted it to. Speaker five. 
Our teacher gave us a choice of projects. Me and two friends opted to paint a group portrait. We thought it'd be fun, but after a while, we realised we weren't getting anywhere. Our first sketches looked ridiculous, and other students in the class weren't exactly kind about them. So then our teacher gave us some advice about what to focus on. The final picture wasn't exactly what we'd hoped for, but it was an improvement on our early efforts, and a lot of that was down to her. To be honest, the portrait should have been good because all three of us are actually quite good at art. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with a young magician called Johnny Frame. For questions twenty-four to thirty, choose the best answer: A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. Today we're talking to the young magician Johnny Frame. People around the world have seen clips on the internet of Johnny performing his amazing tricks. How did you start doing magic, Johnny? It was when I was about twelve. I was small for my age, and for some reason, it was hard for me to make friends. My granddad, who I was close to, said I needed to make sure I was seen in a different way, and he taught me a couple of cool tricks. I did them over and over again with my two sisters, then tried them out at school. They worked brilliantly. Suddenly, everyone there wanted to know me, and I saw what magic could do for me. Interesting. Where do the tricks you do nowadays come from? I read a lot about great magicians from the past, and some tricks I do have been around for ages. Some of my act is nothing like what anyone else does, though. It's inspired by what I see in certain movies, like when things suddenly disappear and you don't know how. <laughs> I rehearse with a couple of friends, and their reactions tell me whether something's going to work. Do you spend lots of time practicing your tricks? Yes. Anyone who's ever tried magic will appreciate how long it takes to get a trick right. You have to be very disciplined, and that's not something everybody would enjoy. If you've seen my videos, you know my act looks natural and improvised. I usually perform in public places, like shopping centres, and I keep my act short and move around a lot. So actually, I only need to be really good at a limited number of illusions, but most people probably wouldn't realise that. What are your typical audiences like? I'm only twenty-three, so I'm often called a young person's magician. In fact, I have lots of younger fans, and it's them I mainly interact with on social media. They ask me where I'll be performing, and even stuff like where I live and what I do in my free time. But I've always appealed to different ages. What I've noticed, though, is that as I get more exposure, expectations rise. People want better tricks than anything they've seen before. Do other magicians watch you perform? Yes, online and live. I realise it's a type of compliment, but I get very worried about what the top guys might think. I've got a long way to go before my magic's up to their standards. But they all make comments to me afterwards, like "That was original. I'd love to know how you did it." <laughs> They're probably exaggerating, but it's nice of them. What would you be doing if you hadn't become a professional magician? I don't know. Even though I tried hard at school, I found most subjects, except art, really difficult. When I finished, there weren't many opportunities open to me, but I loved doing magic. I entered a TV talent show and got through a couple of rounds, 
but didn't get chosen for the final, which was very disappointing. But I didn't consider any other careers. I just spent loads of time at home developing my tricks and working out how to make a living from it, which was probably a mistake, because it would have done me good to experience other things. Could you offer other young magicians any advice? Well, I imagine most people realise it's not easy to do magic professionally. I've been lucky. But it's great, even if it's just a hobby. And what I've come to realise is that magicians vary greatly. Personally, I needed to work out what distinguished me from others and how to show that. And I think that's what all magicians should try and do. Some are great performers, and they've often done drama courses to help them. Others might be really good at the technical side, and they'll use the latest gadgets in their tricks. OK, Johnny, thanks very much. It's been fascinating talking to you. Now you'll hear part four again. Today we're talking to the young magician Johnny Frame. People around the world have seen clips on the internet of Johnny performing his amazing tricks. How did you start doing magic, Johnny? It was when I was about 12. I was small for my age and for some reason it was hard for me to make friends. My granddad, who I was close to, said I needed to make sure I was seen in a different way and he taught me a couple of cool tricks. I did them over and over again with my two sisters, then tried them out at school. They worked brilliantly. Suddenly, everyone there wanted to know me, and I saw what magic could do for me. Interesting. Where do the tricks you do nowadays come from? I read a lot about great magicians from the past, and some tricks I do have been around for ages. Some of my act is nothing like what anyone else does, though. It's inspired by what I see in certain movies, like when things suddenly disappear and you don't know how. <laughs> I rehearse with a couple of friends, and their reactions tell me whether something's going to work. Do you spend lots of time practising your tricks? Yes. Anyone who's ever tried magic will appreciate how long it takes to get a trick right. You have to be very disciplined, and that's not something everybody would enjoy. If you've seen my videos, you'll know my act looks natural and improvised. I usually perform in public places, like shopping centres, and I keep my act short and move around a lot. So actually, I only need to be really good at a limited number of illusions. But most people probably wouldn't realise that. What are your typical audiences like? I'm only 23, so I'm often called a young person's magician. In fact, I have lots of younger fans, and it's them I mainly interact with on social media. They ask me where I'll be performing, and even stuff like where I live and what I do in my free time. But I've always appealed to different ages. What I've noticed, though, is that as I get more exposure, expectations rise. People want better tricks than anything they've seen before. Do other magicians watch you perform? Yes, online and live. I realise it's a type of compliment, but I get very worried about what the top guys might think. I've got a long way to go before my magic's up to their standards. But they all make comments to me afterwards like, that was original, I'd love to know how you did it. <laughs> They're probably exaggerating, but it's nice of them. What would you be doing if you hadn't become a professional magician? <sighs> I don't know. Even though I tried hard at school, I found most subjects, except art, really difficult. When I finished, there weren't many opportunities open to me, but I loved doing magic. I entered a TV talent show and got through a couple of rounds, but didn't get chosen for the final, which was very disappointing. But I didn't consider any other careers. I just spent loads of time at home developing my tricks and working out how to make a living from it, which was probably a mistake because it would have done me good to experience other things. Could you offer other young magicians any advice? Well, I imagine most people realise it's not easy to do magic professionally. I've been lucky. But it's great, even if it's just a hobby. And what I've come to realise is that magicians vary greatly. Personally, I needed to work out what distinguished me from others and how to show that. And I think that's what all magicians should try and do. Some are great performers, and they've often done drama courses to help them. Others might be really good at the technical side, and they'll use the latest gadgets in their tricks. OK, Johnny, thanks very much. It's been fascinating talking to you. That's the end of part four. 
there will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left so that you are sure to finish in time.